So while you're putting your money in uh, to the bowls in the centre for uh, Trojan's Trek, I'll take this opportunity to uh, introduce our guest speaker. So Rotarians and guests, it's my pleasure to introduce Bob Carney, OAM. Bob was recently recognised in the Queen's Birthday Honours with an Order of Australia Medal uh, for service to military history preservation and also for service to the community. Congratulations, Bob. He's an experienced Vietnam vet who was a sec section commander and a platoon sergeant uh, in, at the Vietnam War. And over recent dec decades, as you've found out today, he founded Trojan's Trek, where he's the uh, chief facilitator of this uh, valuable wilderness peer support service for returning soldiers. Bob has also experienced in civil leadership and is regularly called upon by the South Australian Police and the CFS to speak to their staff on leadership. As a military historian, Bob has written and published no less than five books, uh, which is not bad for a person described as a labourer on his enlistment in the army at the age of 17. These books include one titled Silent Voices, which is the story of South Australia's own 10th Battalion in the First World War. Another is, is titled Fallen Saints, uh, which traces the war service of 180 fallen soldiers from St Peter's College. In retirement, Bob volunteers at the RSL where he is affectionately known as the smoking gun. The reason is because people stop, listen and reflect after he has spoken and he's a very well considered man. Another nickname he has recently acquired is the weapon of mass construction reflecting the great work he is doing in building the Virtual War Memorial, whose sign you see up there. And the Virtual War Memorial aims to assist everyday Australians to honour their relatives who have served. And we're very honoured today to have with us the national patron of the, uh, the Virtual War Memorial, Sir Eric Neal. Uh, and also, uh, I should mention that uh, the Virtual War Memorial is the idea of our own member, Steve Larkins. Bob Kearney has a strong personal belief that as a community we should honour all people who serve others and particularly servant leaders. He's going to talk to us today about some military members, uh, sorry, memories, but also leadership and mentoring and leaving a legacy. So please welcome Bob Kearney, OAM. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you, Darcy, and thank you all the members who have supported Trojan's Trek. Um, the only thing I'll say about Trojan's Trek, uh, because I've said so much to you before, is that now that we have the women on there, we have a, what they call the sisters team. They look after themselves or they do it along with us. We also now take police, ambulance officers, and uh, serving members, so uh, it's it's very it's very successful. If you read some of the feedback, you'd be proud that you've been putting your money that way. I'd also like to acknowledge today, Sir Eric Neal, because he and I have got similar backgrounds. You know, I wasn't the governor, but, but we both started work very early in life. So Eric at 14, and myself at 13 which shows me that you can do anything you want to do in this world as long as you put your mind to it. So I'm not going to talk to you about the RSL Virtual War Memorial. I will touch on remembrance because that's what I've asked, been asked to speak about. The only thing I would like to say is that on Remembrance Day on Friday, I'll be down at the Repatriation Hospital. I've been asked to speak down there. And I'm going to tell them what I'm going to tell you now is, as you know, the armistice wasn't until um, 1918, but the war didn't finish, did it, until the, the Treaty of Versailles, and then they had the, the War Act, which finished at about 1920. So I know that on Friday, around Australia, people will be remembering dead people, those who gave their lives. I like to tell people, but what about all the people who have passed away since then and who went through as much, because there are worse things than dying, um, what about those? 
and I'll tell them on Friday that I'm going to tell you now. On Friday 100 years ago, which wasn't uh, 1918 of course, it was 1916, 30 Australians lost their lives. So that's 30 Australians around South Australia, but those 30 Australians, uh, the only people who remember them are they're on our virtual memorial and they're on the Australian War Memorial and probably their families might remember them. So I won't talk too much about the RSL Virtual War Memorial. I just want to ask you a question, and that question being is if we can... I had trouble with this last time. Ah. You have to turn it on. Can you hear me all right out there? Can you hear what I'm saying? Good. All right. So for those people who attended the Don't Forget Me Cobber breakfast, you would have seen me ask that question, who are these people? So you already know. So if you were at the Don't Forget Me breakfast, don't answer. Who, who can tell me the name of the person in the cricket hat? I'll just put up your hands if you can show me, tell me if you know who that is. Oh, well you say you all know Sir Donald Bradman. We recognise him straight away. What about the, a fellow on the right? Yeah, all right, so we all know that's Sir Douglas Mawson. Isn't it amazing? You can drive down Bradman Avenue, you can turn left into the airport, and then you're on a couple of roads of people that you probably don't know. One is Wilkins, and the other one is Wilson. Oh, sorry, Williams, Dickie Williams. Do you know who he was? No, he founded the Australian Air Force. Um, was in the Air Corps during the war. But anyway, I just think it's marvellous that people can remember those uh, because they're legends, they're heroes, uh, if you're a cricket, you know, tragic. But they certainly didn't lack courage and they would have been seen and by those people who knew them as leaders. But the thing about it that amazes me is neither of them are South Australians. Sir Donald came from Bower or New South Wales and yes, I know he lived here and Sir Douglas uh, did a lot of work here, but he was born in York in England, so he's not an Australian. So we know them. What about this knight here? Does anyone know who he is? He's a knight. Yeah, who is he, Win? Yeah, his name's Sir Hubert Wilkins. Now, I'll tell you why I put him up there, because whenever I mention Sir Hubert Wilkins, who, if you look at his chest, he's got a military cross and bar, people don't know who he is. They've Who's he? Never heard of him. I've even asked politicians the other day, uh, what about Sir Hubert Wilkins? Who's he? I said, well, Sir Hubert Wilkins, according to John Monash, was the bravest man in the AIF. He was blown up nine times and he was awarded the military cross for gallantry twice. He was knighted by the King of England because he was the first man ever to fly a plane over both North and South Pole. In fact, when he crashed his plane, the Detroiter, the Smith brothers bought it and now it's called the Southern Cross. They changed the name of it, repainted it and did a bit of work on it. The other thing about him that's pretty important is that he's from Hallett, which is just out of Mount Bryan up the road here, not, not that far out of Jamestown. So he's a South Australian lad and he's the first man to ever put a submarine under ice. He tried to put a submarine under the North Pole and come out at the North Pole, but it wasn't successful. But this still made him the first man to put a $1 submarine under ice. Flew around the world in a Zeppelin. He's done all sorts of major... Uh, he achieved loads of other things, and most South Australians don't know him. In any other country, there would be a monument to him. So we say we will remember them lest we forget, has been added to it. The last line of Lawrence Binion's poem is, we will remember them. And I always say, who? Who are we going to remember on Friday? I'll tell you who I'm going to remember on Friday. I'm going to remember a fellow called Trevor Lynch, who was with me in Vietnam, who was behind another bloke who stepped on a jumping jack mine. When the jumping jack mine jumps out of the ground, it goes off at waist height. It went off, killed the bloke who stepped on it, and blew Trevor Lynch's front of his body off him almost, his eyes were out on his face and the medics had to tie his hands up so they could treat him. He's a 21 year old national serviceman. I met him 
when he was 50, after that I met him when he was 50. He'd been living in the Blind Institute for a load of years with old people and said to me just before he died of liver cancer, do you think I'll get another go, dogs? I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I got called up at 21, I got blinded and bashed up and I've been living here on my own and now I've got liver cancer. Do you think you get another go? And then I twigged to what he was talking about, reincarnation or recycling. I said, mate, you'll definitely get another go. You're a special. You're going to come back as a rock star or a movie star. I said, you will probably be the next Sir Elton John with that. He put his hand in my hand and went to sleep. Not long after that, he died. I'll be remembering him. I'll be remembering the blokes that I put on helicopters that were wounded and dead. But I will be remembering lots of people, not just the people who landed in Anzac Cove on the 25th of April. So I will be remembering those who served and suffered but came home without legs, without eyes, were maimed or insane. I will be remembering them. So you should be thinking before Friday, who will you be remembering? And if you want to, you can look at the virtual war memorial. You probably don't know this fellow, but if I mention his name, if I say Sir Edward Waterfield Haywood, who does know him? Yeah, well, you know that he used to own Carrick Hill, did, didn't he? He never had any children, so he had lots of dogs. He donated Carrick Hill to the state. But the thing about him is Bill Haywood was highly decorated. Um, he was in the islands and he was in the 48th Battalion. He was in um, the Middle East. Came home, started Coca-Cola South Australia uh, because his father had started John Martins. Uh, his father passed away and he continued. He set up our first Australian Christmas pageant. So here's another knight and another high achiever who a lot of people, if you put their photo up, they don't even know who they are. Now I don't criticise people for that. All I'm saying is all leaders, which you all are, and that's why you're in this room, you are all leaders, have inquiring minds. And I think leaders must have inquiring minds. They should be asking themselves something one old mentor used to say, and he used to say, why is it so? He used to take the egg and you put the egg in the bottle and there it goes. Now why is that so, young man? He never gave the answers, he asked the questions. So there's another great South Australian. What are the golden threads? Well, yes, they're knighted, but we don't have knighthoods any now, anymore. Well, we do because we just knighted the Duke of Edinburgh, but we, um, we don't get into that too much anymore. But, but, you know, you're all high achievers. That's why you're here. You're all high achievers and you've all achieved at the top of your game. So they achieved at the top of their game. They were high achievers. They all had courage, both moral and physical. It must have taken a lot of courage to stand up and body line and try and bat some of those balls away. It certainly wouldn't take in the same amount of courage that uh, Sir Hubert used rushing through the trenches looking at soldiers and photographing them all because he was the first man who ever photographed battlefields. He did it in the Balkans War and then he worked for Charles Bean right throughout the Great War. And most of the photos on the War Memorial are his photographs, him or Hurley's. Leader managers, you're all leader managers. Well, I hope you are. I hope you're not just managers. Managers manage formula and complexity. Leaders lead people. Colin Powell once said, leadership is the art of achieving more than the science of management says is possible. When I was managing E Division, B Division, F Division at Yatla Labor Prison and parts of the Adelaide Remand Centre and all of it at times, I had to go and learn about complexity and formula. I had to learn about staffing. I had to learn about accrual accounting. But I knew a fair bit about leadership. And I've never had leader on my door. They always put manager and I wish they'd put leader. So everyone needs to leave a legacy. And you're doing that with what you do here today. You're already leaving a legacy. But you know, it's very important that you understand that we all get a box of life. Now this is only my thoughts and I made this up myself, so if you want to criticise it, do it later, will you? <laughs> so, where you came from, well, I can't tell you where I came from and I don't know, I know it wasn't Baghdad, and where I'm going to, I don't know and I don't care. It is outside of my circle of influence and things that are outside of my circle of influence are always outside of my circle of concern. So if I can't change them, I just don't worry about them. 
I can't say who's going to be the next president, and I don't care because it's outside of my circle of influence. Something will happen. All right, so you get a box of life. Sir Hubert Wilkins and Donald Bradman and all that, they used up their box of life. So when you start, you started at zero, uh, and uh, most blokes go along to somewhere about 80 now. It's three score and tens over, over the top now. How long have I been talking for? Tell me. <laughs> Too long. All right, so if I look at my box of life, my, that part's history. I'm 70, so therefore the 70 years that I've lived I can do nothing about. Uh, yes, I made a lot of mistakes, but somewhere along the line I started to think, you know, I want my life to mean something. I don't want my life... I, lived in, I worked in a factory when I was 13 and I didn't want to finish my life working in a factory. So, somewhere in your life, you can travel a number of paths. A lot of people travel the victim path all their life, and you know who they are. They're the people who are saying, poor me, poor me, pour me a drink. Or, you know, it's not my fault. I didn't get a good education. I left school when I was 14. My mum didn't give me a push bike. You know, you've met those sort of people. They're still doing it. They're, they're travelling the victim path. So, I don't want to. I want to travel the warrior path. So, I became a seeker. I wanted to know, why is it so? And every time somebody told me a new word, I'd go back and look it up. I used to call paradigm paradigm. I used to call the Sioux Indians the Sioux when I was reading comics, and the Cheyenne the Cheenies. And I used to make a fool of myself saying dumb things like fuzz instead of thus. So, or things for me used to go awry until somebody said, you mean awry. So why don't they spell it that way? So I taught myself a lot of things, but I became a protege and got somebody who I respected as a mentor. After a while, I became a leader. I was a leader in Vietnam on both tours. In fact, I was a platoon sergeant, but I was a platoon commander for most of the time. And today, I think I'm a mentor, and I try to be a mentor, like you probably are too. Can I just ask you, who was mentor? Yep. You were? No. Who was mentor? I'll tell you why I asked you that question. I was asked to go to the Australian Human Resources Institute and... I forgot to... <laughs> I was asked, I'm sorry, I'm really terrified I'm going to hold you all up. I was asked to go to the Australian Human Resources Institute and, and they said, oh, we'll be at this certain hotel at a certain time and we'll buy you dinner. I said, yeah, I'll do that. What am I talking about? They said, mentoring. I said, oh... How many will be there? 60. I said, only 60? I said, well, what happened to the rest of you? There's thousands of people in the Australian Human Resources Institute. I thought I would have drew a bigger crowd than that. They said, oh, no, no, no. These people are people who specialise in mentoring. Oh, all right, so you want me to talk about mentoring? Yeah, that'd be nice. So I got up, stood up here like this now, and I said to them, who was mentor? Not a person in the room knew. I'll tell you who mentor was. Mentor and you can see I've got an old man there talking to young children. I'm coming back to mentor, but the reason I've got that old man there is because of this. When I was working on an or in an organisation called Trojan's Trek, which is to then be run by a woman called Pamela Lower Murray White, I found the only way I could get those little kids to listen to me was to be different. So I took on the role of persona, a different persona, Knuckleina Bob, and they were terrified of me. So I'd tell them all these wonderful stories and I don't think I told them the truth at any time other than little um, stories that had a, a meaning and they got the meaning of it. At the end of it, that Pamela Murray White said to me, what would you like to do with the rest of your life? I was in my 40s then and she's sitting there in the Blinman pub looking me straight in the eye and I thought she must be an areodologist. She's probably spotted a tumour in the back of my brain or my heart. What am I doing? What do you mean? I said, what do you mean the rest of my life? She said, what would you like to be? And I said, I'd like to be a very interesting grandfather. She said, why? I said, because mine was as boring as batshit. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, it wasn't his fault. He didn't know. He was messed up from the war. He would say to me, what are you doing, Robert? What are you doing here? I'd say, I'll live here, Grandpa. He'd say, go on, get outside. You know, come home when you're bleeding. Children should be not seen and not heard. Or, what are you doing in here? Adults are talking. Go on, get out of here. And he taught me the most magnificent lesson he could have ever taught me, and he didn't even know it. And you know what that was? As a grandparent, as a leader, 
and particularly as a mentor, it's not important for you to be interesting. But there is no excuse for not being interested. And that old fellow there is interested in his grandchildren because he's telling them stories. You'll see his wife sitting over to one side there. He's doing what grandparents and mentors should be doing. He's communicating, but more importantly, he's engaging with them. And so you need to engage with people. So if you look at the wolves, the way the wolf pack works, is up in the front, in the yellow, are the weaker, younger, older and sicker wolves. And the reason they're up the front is because they set the pace. They don't get left behind. Because the leadership team, like in a football team, are there marked in the red box. They are leaders, pretty strong leaders, and they keep pushing the older and sicker and uh, younger along and guiding them. The rest of the mob just follow the pack and right down the back you'll see the alpha wolf. The alpha wolf keeps quiet, watches, overviews, sees it all, but is delegated to the other wolves. I could go on about that all day, but I haven't got time. Unlike the geese, the old and the weak and the sick in geese, flocks, they all fly in that formation. You know why they fly in that formation? Ducks, pelicans, geese, all migrating birds fly in that formation because the one at the front breaks the resistance, the next two help break the resistance. By the time it gets down to old Bob, that's me down the back. I've been up the front before. I'm <laughs> and I'm yelling out to people like David, keep going, mate, you're doing a really good job. Yeah, you can do it, keep going, keep going. And up the front, he's yelling out, come on, Bob, come on, keep going, keep going, keep going. You know what the gift of the geese is? It's not the fact that they fly in that formation. It's not the fact that when one goes to the ground, three go to the ground with it and then they take off in another little V. It's not the fact that they break the resistance for those who follow. The gift of the geese is they're honking. What they're doing is cheering each other along. So they don't go around tearing each other apart, they cheer each other along. So they're saying to the young and the weak who are at the back, come on, come on, we're going to keep you going, just ride on the lift that we're creating for you, because that's what we do. Because one day I'll be an old goose and I'll have to travel down there and you younger blokes can get up the front there and do your bit. Here's a bit of critical wisdom for you and I'm nearly finished. Chicken and a pig are in a barnyard and the chicken says to the pig, hey Porky, do you like this here barnyard? The pig says, oh I love it. I've been in a few barnyards, but I don't want to ever leave this one. This is the best barnyard I've ever been in. The chicken said, me too. I like you little critters with cloven hoofs, and I like everybody in the barnyard. And the pig said, yeah, including Charlotte the spider and the rat and the, the dog, and I like everyone. Yeah, you know, the chicken says, why don't we celebrate the fact that we're living in the most wonderful barnyard in the world? The pig said, well, that'd be a good idea. What are we do? And the chicken said, how about Friday week, we put a barnyard breakfast on and we invite all the critters over? including the dog. Pig said, that sounds like a good idea. What are we going to have? The chicken says, bacon and eggs. You see, for the chicken, there's a bit of involvement. But for the pig, that's commitment. <laughs> so I say to you, if you are going to be mentors, great grandmothers and grandfathers and continue your leadership in the way you should be doing it, and that is as servant leaders, remember... <coughs> Everybody counts or nobody counts. Those who don't serve customers serve those who do. So instead of sitting at the top of the pyramid, put yourself at the bottom of the pyramid and give all those people in between everything they need to serve your customers. Make sure you do what Darcy's done with Adrian. Now, Adrian hasn't tweaked yet, Darcy, but you're mentoring him. You're making him every second month do all the procedure here, am I right? Yeah, I'm on to you, mate. My first, my first mentor was an Aborigine, and I'll tell you a little bit about him. He had a military medal for bravery in Korea. He was as black as my shoes. He had really white teeth. His hat was too big. He was a hero in every way. And he took a liking to me because I played a sport that he coached. He used to come down when I was a recruit, and I was 17 years old and very cheeky, and he'd say, you shut up and listen. And I'd say, what's that? And he'd tell me things like... Daniel saying, look I, look I, wax on, wax off, sand to the floor, sand to the floor, paint up, paint down. Who am I talking about? 
Mr. Miyagi, Mr. Miyagi from the Karate Kid, he wasn't a trainer or a coach, was he? He was a mentor. Well, my first one was called Midnight Houston. Now, in the army, that was never seen, I know it's very incorrect, politically incorrect, but army blokes are all colourblind. In the army, everybody's green. We never took notice of our colour, and they'd call us all sorts of things, but he was wonderful, and it took me 40 years to realise that he wasn't teaching me, he was mentoring me. You know how you can tell what a good mentor is? They live in your head long after they're dead. So, if you want to be a, um, a good, did I go through all that? If you want to be a good mentor, leave on a higher plane. Leave in a way that people will remember and you will live in their head. So that means your box of life actually meant something. So if you are engaging with your grandchildren, um, I'll put those up there. <laughs> I'll put those up there just to tell you that if I had more time, I would tell you all about the wisdom of the meerkat. In fact, I used to teach the CFS meerkats because why do they survive in the most hostile environment in the Kalahari Desert where they shouldn't survive but they actually flourish? Why? Because they work within the values of their little group and they have laces. Laces stands for lookouts, awareness, situational awareness. They communicate effectively. They always leave escape routes and they all know where the safety zone is. Thank you. No, no, you're right, Bob. Plenty of time. So we have got time for questions, but I'm just going to ask you one just before I accept some others, because you were going to tell us who Mentor was, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't hear you to say who Mentor was. Did he say who he was? No. So he's going to tell us. Yeah, I was a bit nervous with all, all you old chiefs and Indians looking at me. Mentor, I'll tell you, and you should remember this, was the neighbour of Odysseus. If you read Homer's Iliad, Odyssey, you'll find in there a fella called Odysseus. Odysseus had to go to the Trojan War. That's why we call this Trojan Trek. He had to go to the Trojan War. So he said to his wife Penelope, who's going to look after the kids? And she said, I will. He said, I oh, know, you'll feed them and clothe them. The two girls will be all right, but what about Telemachus? He's only 10 years old and I'll be away at the war. And she said, well, go next door and ask Mentor to look after him. So he did. And he asked Mentor, will you pat him on the back when he needs a pat on the back, kick him up the backside if he needs it, just teach him, guide him, coach him. I'm going to war. Yeah, all right, I'll do that for you. As you know from uh, Greek mythology and history, Odysseus was away for 10 years and then when he got home he got lost for a year like a lot of old soldiers do. And by the time he got home, his son Telemachus was now 21. He looked at Telemachus and thought, he knows all about the planets and the heavens, he knows all about mathematics, he's kind to his mother and his sisters, he's kind to animals, he's kind to people, he's got really good strong values and I didn't do any of this. So he goes to Mentor and says, Mentor, how can I thank you for what you did for my son? Mentor says, oh that's alright Odysseus, I only done what you asked me to do. He said, no, you did a lot more than I asked. He said, what did, what did I do, what do you mean? I did a lot more. He said, you were actually the father I couldn't be. So if you're going to take on the role of a mentor, make sure that you respect your protege. I do not mentor lazy, indolent people. I mentor people who are fair dinkum. Otherwise, they just drain you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. OK, we've got some questions, I'm sure. So, yeah, Peter Bartley. Not sure that I'm on. Uh, thank you very much. For, uh, if, look, I'm probably speaking for everyone. I want to say this before I ask my question, but that's one of the most motivating uh, speakers we've had for a long, long time. So thank you very much for what I think is a very inspirational talk today. Uh, my question to you is, you've talked about how we're, we're all men we can be mentors in society. Why don't you talk a little bit about um, what you see in terms of mentorship um, at the political leadership level, because we seem to be lacking that, not just here, but, but globally. And we see what's happening in the US. And just wonder, could you comment on that and um, how you think we can change that? Because 
you, you did allude to the fact of how people treat Sir Donald Bradman as a, as a legend and a hero, which he was in some ways, but I often look and see some of the famous uh, scientists and people who do so much for society who are not held in the same regard. And I, I think at more senior levels in government and public society, we need more people, more of those people to be mentors and leaders in their own right. Now, I've got to tell you, I'm a bit deaf. <laughs> Two tours of Vietnam made me like that, and all the fires I've been fighting all my life, I'm a bit deaf. But I think what I got from that was, you want me to uh, comment on what I think about some of our political leaders and are they actually leaders, and what should they be doing? Yeah. Well, I've got to say, I'm a bit disappointed in politicians generally, and one of my problems in life is that I tell them. Uh, I don't write to them or ring them, and I don't make a nuisance of myself, but I do think that there's too much listening to what I call the six percenters. My opinion is, and I made this up when I was in the army, that 6% of every infantry rifle company are trouble. Two in each platoon and one in the company headquarters. If you think of your company, if you've got 100 people working for you, six of them are gonna be the ones who are always causing you the grief. 14 follow them, that 20% make life miserable for 80%. If you are a leader and you are afraid to piss people off, you will piss off the wrong people. I think that leaders need to remember they don't manage by committee. They certainly consult, but at the end of the day, you go with the consensus. Right? They need to have the courage to stand up for all of us, not the squeaky wheels. Because if you think about good leadership, I, from a leader, want direction. The Army used to teach me to be fair, firm and friendly. Until I became a Sergeant Major, I thought that would work, but it doesn't. Sergeant Majors are not friendly. When I was running B Division at Yatla Labor Prison, I had 170 of the worst felons in this state and maybe this country, and including some probably whose name I shouldn't mention, but I will because they're so well known, like Bevan Spencer von Einem, the Barrel Boys, Big Jim Smith. I had all of them. And my policy always was to be fair, firm and approachable. But I don't want to be friendly with serial killers and child molesters. I don't want to be friendly with everybody in my electorate if I'm a member of parliament. I want to be approachable, but I'm not going to like them all. And I'm not going to take everything everybody says and try and make it work. I'm going to listen to the majority because I'm there to lead, right? I told you, managers manage stuff. And trying to manage the media and manage six percenters, you're wasting your time. Lead the people who you know are doing the right thing. I'd tell all of them if it was me, Think about the 80 percenters, I'm sorry. All right, did that answer your question in a very short, long way? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going Dogs, to... Dogs, I think this is something that you would appreciate, having acted as platoon sergeant and platoon commander, that like those geese, the one that's at the front does actually rotate. They actually take it in turns. They don't all take it on all the time. In other words, the guys at the top have to work together. That's what I've seen in the services. You, like uh, Eddie Sawinski in Vietnam, you see copter jumping Jack. What was he doing? He was acting platoon commander. Now, you've done the same thing. And I think here at Rotary, it's much the same thing. They're rotating this leadership. Yeah. It's like Darcy's monitoring someone. Mentoring someone, sorry, wrong word. And I think that's something we've got to really take on board. You can't expect the same person to be taking on all responsibility all the time. It's something a leader's got to guard against too. He cannot be responsible for everything. He's got to actually delegate. Mm. Can I can I just say something on that? I totally agree with delegation. I totally agree with mentoring. And that's why the geese, when the head goose is really tired, the head goose drops back a bit and the next geese move up until that goose has rested a bit. And that's what you were saying. 
I totally agree that when I was a platoon sergeant, I would sometimes give the platoon commander a bit of a break. But after two com platoon commanders had gone, I was it. So I did what I could. But I've got to say this. The leader is not actually responsible. The leader is accountable. You can delegate responsibility to people, but you can never delegate accountability. So if you are a leader and you want somebody to do it, you better pick the right people because you can make them responsible to do the job, but if they're not up to it because you didn't pick the right people, you didn't train them properly, when it all goes wrong, you'll be accountable. Thanks, Bob. I think that uh, brings us to the end of time, sorry. So if you've got some further comments or questions, you might like to come and have a talk to Bob after. Bob, just before you go, can I just say, from a rotary perspective, as Wynn was saying, and Wynn's an old Vietnam vet too, so thanks for your comments there, Wynn. Very appropriate today. Um, from a rotary perspective, what you're talking about is, is very true. And I think when we look at our club, uh, we have many older members. I think last year we assessed we had 46% over 70 and 60% over 60. But there are uh, people that have served. There are people that have got uh, wonderful skills and knowledge. And I think this concept of mentoring is something that we, we, we really want to develop going forward as we bring in new, new younger members. And uh, so your words today have been very, very apt and appropriate and we'll certainly take them on board. Thank you, Bob, for a wonderful address. Thank you. Um, very, very.